Let us now go on to look at some of the uh, the use of some of these logical operators. Okay, so here we are saying filter flights month is 11 or month is 12. So in this case, what we are saying is give me all the flights that either took off in November or December. Right, so we are using the OR operator right here. This is the OR operator, the vertical bar. Okay, so and of course this is going to give you some of the results. Right, or we could say November, December equals this. Okay, uh, so we could assign the results to November, December, or alternately do November underscore December is filter flights. Instead of saying month equals 11 or month equals 12, you can say month in C11, 12. And the in you put it between two percentage signs. Okay, that's another convenience operator uh, to avoid too many of or conditions like this. Both of these are equivalent in terms of results. Okay, now there are also two other operators, double and and uh, you know and 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 or or, but they differ slightly from and and or, and we look at them later on. So right now we are only going to look at the single and and or versions okay these are slightly different in terms of how they operate and we look at them later so while we are on the topic of discussing logical operators let's also look at how all of this works with missing values we already know that missing values are represented with na in r so suppose you make a comparison of na greater than 5 is na greater than 5 is it true or is it false okay now given the fact that Na is a missing value or an, another way to represent that is to say we don't know. If we don't know this, then how can we give a concrete answer for Na greater than 5? So the result has to be we don't know. It's neither true nor false. It's unknown. right? So in general, any operation, logical operation uh, you perform with Na, the result is going to be Na because you don't know the value. right? So is 10 equal to unknown? Don't know. What is 10 plus unknown? don't know. What is 10 uh, unknown divided by 2? We don't know. Most interesting of all, is Na equal to Na? Again, given the fact that both are unknown, the answer has to be Na. We don't know. Okay, so this is interesting. To make this very concrete, let's consider a concrete example. Let X be Mary's age and we don't know her age. So X is Na. Let Y be John's age. We don't know his age. So Y is Na. Now we ask a question, are John and Mary the same age, which is, is x equal to y? Well, the answer has to be, we don't know, because we don't know their individual ages. So how can we say if they are of the same age, the result has to be na, or we don't know. Okay. So the point is that any operations you perform with na's, the result is always going to be na. Okay. Now when you apply functions like computing the mean or the median, on a set of values in which there are some unknowns, once again the system will be unable to compute uh, the mean or the median because there are some missing values and the result will depend upon the values which are missing. So it will tell you we don't know the answer. right? So if you compute the mean of a set of numbers and there is at least one Na sitting in those numbers, the result is going to be Na. That's also very important to consider. So now suppose you have a variable and you want to test if it's got an Na value, you can use the function is dot Na of x. So in this case, x is Na. We know that because that's what we created here. So if you say is dot Na x, answer is going to be true. That is, yeah, we don't know what the value of x is. Okay. Now coming to the point about the function filter, right? You have a set of values, and you perform a filtering on that with certain conditions. Filter includes only those conditions for which the those rows for which the result is actually true. If the result is Na, then filter doesn't include those results. Okay. So, for example, suppose we create a table. Uh, like I said, it's uh, just a modified data frame with only one column. X is C one Na three. Okay. That is, there's only one column in this data frame. The name of the column is X, and that there are only three values. The values are one unknown and 3. Okay. Now if I do a filter of the data frame for x greater than 1, okay, so it's going to include only this last value because that's the only one that is known to be greater than 1. This one we don't know. right? We don't know if this is greater than 1 or less than 1 or equal to 1. We don't know anything about this because this is missing. 
and filter does not include anything whose result is NA. Okay. So the only value out of these three for which x greater than 1 is true is this value and therefore that's the only thing that's going to be returned as your result. Okay. So filter only includes the true values. If on the other hand you also want to include the NAs in your results for whatever reason then you can do this. You can say filter df which is the same as the data frame we created here. Filter df and include all those rows for which this condition is true or this condition is true. So we are saying if x is not available, so this condition becomes true. Is dot na x? Yeah, it's na for the second value or if x is greater than 1. So this will include the second and the third values, right? If you look at this, this is na, this is greater than 1. So both of these will be included in this condition, this filter is dot na x or x is greater than 1. Both of them will now get included. Let us now take a look at some examples. Okay, how can we find the flights that had an arrival delay of more than 2 hours? Okay, so now in this data frame or table, uh, there is a field called arrival delay and that is recorded in number of minutes. So clearly we can filter the data frame by arrival delay greater than 120. So we can do this. We can say filter flights arrival delay greater than 120. That's two hours because the arrival delay is recorded as number of minutes. Okay, so filter can be used to answer this question. How about filtering flights that flew to one of the Houston airports, which is uh, the airport code being, uh, being IAH or HOU. So once again, we can filter by the uh, you know the, the airport destination uh, being this so you could say filter flights destination equals HOU or destination equals IAH right because we are saying it went to this or this so obviously we put the same or condition alternately a better way of writing this could be filter flights destination percent in percent C HOU IAH okay so both of these are equivalent this is just a more uh, concise way of writing it especially if you have multiple OR conditions it's easier to combine it uh, multiple OR conditions on the same uh, attribute or on the same column then it's a good idea to put it in this fashion. Flights that were operated by United, American or Delta so this is the operator code or the carrier code uh, so uh, bef before we do that first of all we don't know what carrier codes have been stored in the uh, data frame so you could first find out the carrier code by using the unique function unique flights dollar carrier let's jump into uh, the data uh, into our studio and take a look at this so if i did directly uh, flights dollar carrier and if i execute this line of code obviously there are going to be numerous values of carrier right because this data frame has 336,000 plus rows 335,576 uh, or, or more actually plus 1,336,000 rows so in order to find out how exactly these airline codes have been coded in this we can we can do this but instead it will be better for us to say well just list for me the different carrier values that exist in the data frame you don't have to list all the values just show me what are the different ones that are listed. So then you can use the unique function, unique, and then we can do flights dollar carrier. Okay, so what this is going to do is it's going to get all the carrier values, but then show us only the unique different values that exist without any duplicates. Okay, so now we know all the airline codes that exist in our file, and we have been asked to find out uh, United American Delta so we know that United is UA American is AA and Delta is DL so we can use this right so we can say filter flights for carrier is UA or carrier equals AA or carrier equals DL and we get the result of course we could also use the same approach we used in the last slide in terms of saying carrier percent in percent C UA A DL Notice that I've used double quotes and single quotes interchangeably. That's fine. 
you can use double quotes or single quotes to represent character strings. So let's filter the flights that departed in summer and for the purpose of this question summer is considered July, August, September. Okay, so now we know that there is a column in the data frame called month and it has a values 1 to 12, right? So July, August, September is going to be 7, 8 or 9. So we could do it in two ways. One is to say filter flights month greater than or equal to 7 and month less than or equal to 9. You don't have to say and because I'm just putting a comma. Or you could say and use the ampersand. You could do that. Or we could also use since it's a numeric and you're talking about values, contiguous values, you can use the between function. Flights between month 7 and 9. That means where the month is between 7 and 9. Right? So you use the percent in operator for discrete values when you're going to say the value is this or this or this. But when you've got a continuous value like 7 and 9 and you want the value to be anywhere in between, then you can use the between function. Let's consider one more question. Flights that arrived more than two hours late but did not depart late. That is the flights departed on time, the departure time, uh, departure delay is zero but arrival delay is more than 120. Okay, so we could again use filter. Filter flights, departure delay is zero and arrival delay is greater than or equal to 120. And if you just put a comma, implicitly it's an and, so uh, this is fine, right? Or alternately, you could put an ampersand and write this condition as well. That'll also work. Flights that departed late by at least an hour, but made up more than 30 minutes in flight. Okay, so clearly we here we can say the departure delay is greater than uh, uh, greater than or equal to 60. But how do you say made up more than 30 minutes in flight? That means the arrival delay is less than or equal to or less than the departure delay minus 30. Right? That is how you know that let's say the flight left by uh, left late by two and a half hours, two hours. Okay, that is 120 minutes. But made up over 30 minutes at flight, that means its arrival delay must be less than or equal to 90. Right? So that means departure delay minus 30. So the arrival delay should be less than or equal to the departure delay or less than departure delay minus 30. So we can do that. Right? So where departure delay is greater than or equal to 60, that is departed late by at least an hour. And arrival delay is less than departure delay minus 30, which means it made up 30 minutes in flight. So now we can look at flights that departed between midnight and 6 a.m. inclusive. Okay, this is a little bit tricky because first of all, you have to know how the departure time is recorded in the data. So let's jump into our studio and look at, uh, just look at flights uh, to see how the departure time is recorded. Okay, so here you've got departure time and the departure time is recorded like this, 517, 533, 542. Okay. Uh, so this is probably recorded in, uh, you know, in uh, military time, like 0500 is 5 a.m. So 517 is probably, uh, uh, you know, 517 a.m. Okay, so probably, but we need to confirm that. So to confirm that, a good way would be for us to look at, uh, for all the, you know, uh, departure times less than, let's say, uh, less than 100, if you look at the maximum of the minutes part of it or just look at the maximum of departure times less than 100 right if that is 60 then you know that you know or 59 then you know that the minute that the last two digits really represent the minutes and the first two digits represents the 24 hour clock hour right but we just want to confirm that okay so to confirm that what i thought we could do is first look at uh, you know find out all the uh, flights for which the departure time is less than 100. Okay, we don't know what that is. I'm assuming that is flights that departed between midnight and 1 a.m. Right, and then look at the maximum of that. If that is nowhere near 100, if it's only 59 or 60 or 59 actually, then you know that the, you know, the last two digits really represents the minutes. Right, we want to confirm that. So we can execute this line of code. So let's go here and actually execute 
uh, that line of code that I had there. So I'm saying filter flights departure time less than 100. Okay, so now let's look at FL and see what it is. Okay, there are still 874 more rows and the departure times are like, you know, 42, 32, 50, etc, etc. Nothing is above 59. So it looks like our hypothesis is correct. But let's completely confirm that by taking the maximum of this is this is now a data frame FL is now a data frame, which is a filtered data frame. So let's look at all the departure times there and take the maximum of those. Okay, so if you did that, you find the maximum is indeed 59. Okay, so even though we took all the departure times less than 100, we found that the maximum was only 59. Okay, so that clearly tells us that uh, when you look at the times that are recorded here, the departure times, that the last two digits really represent the minutes in the departure time. Okay, so and and the first two uh, therefore represent the 24 hour hour clock. So 517 is really 517 a.m. and 558 is really 558 a.m. 558 is 558 a.m. Okay, uh, so uh, first we found out how the times are stored, and we can do this these two steps in one step, right? We can do maximum of instead of FL dollar departure time, we can just put this whole expression in there. Okay, uh, so instead of FL, we put in this whole expression and then said dollar departure time. So what is here is completely equivalent to what we have here. We have just done it in one step, right? In other words, filter flights departure time less than 100. Starting from this, uh, from, uh, you know, filter up to the end of this parenthesis. That's a data frame, which is what we called FL here. So from the data frame, we can always do dollar departure time to get all the departure times and then take the max of that that will give us the maximum departure time. Okay, so this is just a way of writing this in one line of code. Okay, so now we can go and look at flights that departed between midnight and 6 a.m., which means that our departure time is, uh, you know, between zero and 6 a.m. is 600. Okay, so we can do f filter flights between departure time 0, 600, or even we can say departure time less than 600. Th that would also have the same effect. Okay, so this question is not related to filter, but we're just asking a question, which one hour time block has the maximum number of departures? Right, so now we want to count the departures by our block, meaning midnight to 1 a.m., 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., 2 a.m. to 3 a.m., which one hour time block has the maximum number of departures? Okay, now typically we would answer this kind of a question by plotting a histogram. So let's look at that. Here, histogram flights dollar departure time. If you run that, you get this, and clearly it looks like this is the time block. Okay, so this is 5 to 6, 6 to 7, 7 to 8, 8 to 9. So it looks like 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. had the maximum number of departures, which is uh, uh, 25,000 or so departures, or is that 250,000? It's 25,000. Okay, so that's one way to find that part of it. So we could do it with this.